Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, yet another seminar of uh, an optimal seminar series devoted to energy optimization and learning. So today we have a pleasure to have uh, Joanna Matthew with us who will kick off this uh, spring uh, season of the seminar series. And um, um, if you followed uh, research in uh, energy and control, uh, I'm sure you met uh, Joanna Matthew before person or in a paper. So uh, Joanna, she is an associate professor of electrical computer engineering in the University of Michigan. And before joining Michigan, she uh, did her PhD and master uh, degrees at the University of California at Berkeley. And before that, she uh, did her bachelor in um, ocean uh, research at uh, uh, MIT. So, and now that she gives a talk at MIT, the cycle is completed, right? <laughs> so, and, uh, 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 she's a recipient of uh, many prestigious awards, among them is NSF Career Award, uh, among many others. And uh, we know Joanna, thanks to her research at the interface of uh, uh, electric power systems and control. So she works towards reducing environmental impacts um, and cost and uh, inefficiencies in electrical energy systems. And uh, she works on developing uh, methods for stochastic control and planning of those systems. So uh, welcome, uh, Joanna. Welcome, everyone. So uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, uh, let's make this section as interactive as possible. So please feel free to unmute yourself to ask your questions or drop them in the chat and I will address them to Joanna. So Joanna, the floor is yours, please. Great. Thanks so much, Vlad. And thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I can't see the chat window easily while I have my slides up. So if something comes through in the chat, can you just interrupt me and let me know? Yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks. Okay, so today I'm gonna to tell you about our work um, planning for uncertainty in coupled power and water net distribution networks. Uh, this is joint work with my student, Anna Stuhlmacher, um, and supported by a few different NSF grants that we have. Okay, so the motivation for our work is that there's a lot of interest now in optimizing and controlling coupled infrastructure networks, especially critical infrastructure networks that have to operate at high reliability. Um, so there's work on power, natural gas networks, power transportation, and of course, power and water, which I'll talk about here. Um, the water network requires power for many, many different things, extraction treatment um, and distribution processes through pumping. Uh, the power network also requires water for cooling um, and uh, emission scrubbing and fuel extraction and processing. So these are inherently interdependent. Um, they're interdependent to the point where the Department of Energy has invested a lot of time and effort on um, trying to understand these interdependencies and sort of how we can think about doing more operations of these networks together instead of separate. Um, so here's a report that's quite old at this point, eight years old, um, on the energy water nexus. And so that's um, a term that people use to refer to the sector. So if you're interested in more background, this has kind of uh, motivated a lot of the, the more recent work in this space. So today I'm gonna to specifically talk about water and power distribution networks. And so for water distribution networks, it's, we're gonna focus on the drinking water distribution network, which requires um, pumps to move drinking water around. Um, and the power distribution network are the, you know, the smaller power lines that run through people's neighborhoods. Um, so there's new operational challenges associated with these networks. There's increasing water demand, um, in some places, there's increasing electric demand, but there's also increasing levels of distributed energy resources. So adding batteries and solar, electric vehicles, and other interesting new technologies to the distribution grid has changed power flows. Um, and that's causing a variety of different challenges in power systems. Um, and then there's concerns about the reliability and the resilience of both of these networks. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working on a study right now um, uh, with some partners where we're looking at flooding that happened in downtown Detroit recently, uh, where the pumps failed, um, which caused more flooding, which then can in turn affect the power system and cause more flooding. And so there's these things that can kind of spiral out of control. So there's a lot of discussions in the resilience space about how to make these networks um, more reliable and not fail. And then when they do fail, come back online as quickly as possible. So here we're going to talk more about operational um, needs for these systems. How do we operate these networks to improve reliability um, and decrease capital and operational costs? Um, on this side, you can see this is a, a one-line diagram of um, a power network. And here's an example of a water uh, drinking water network where here are the reservoirs and here are two pumps. 
And these pumps are connected to the power network at these two nodes. Um, so that's the direct coupling here. So there's a lot of different sources of flexibility in coupled power and water distribution networks and the drinking water network. Um, you're moving water around with pumps and you can store it in tanks. You can send it to the consumers. Consumers have water consuming flexible loads, meaning that you can change, you potentially can change when water is consumed at households, especially if there's storage of water. And then on the electric side, um, there's electricity, there's some electricity storage in the form of batteries in the distribution network, although it's not very pervasive right now. Um, we can control renewable resources that are connected to the distribution network. There's flexible loads. Customers sometimes have batteries as well, um, and also photovoltaic systems. So this is trying to sort of look at and understand what resources are flexible at, in, the, in the net, these two networks and what resources are flexible at the consumers and leveraging the flexibility and of both these networks and sort of making them work together can better manage um, uh, operational issues that might occur um, when operating either network or both networks. So here's my disclaimer. <laughs> I'm a power systems person. I'm not a water network expert, but I've been working on this problem now for about four or five years with a student. So we've picked up a lot of the details we need to understand the water network, but I'm mainly thinking about this problem from the perspective of power networks, like how can we leverage flexibility in the water network to help the power network, but you could also look at it the other way around, um, but we'll do less of that in the talk today. Um, so the bulk of my work looks at things like how to leverage flexibility to balance renewables. Uh, these are two plots of wind um, power production, both in Australia, but this one gives the power production over a day at different sites in Australia, and this one gives it a, a, over two weeks at different sites in Australia again. And you can just see, of course, wind power is incredibly um, variable and it's it's also hard to predict and solar power similarly. So this is the output of a solar farm in Arizona. And every time a cloud goes over this farm, there's a huge dip in production. Um, and so these sorts of things are great challenges to the power system. And so we need more sources of flexibility to sort of balance out this variability. And so a lot of my work looks at using flexible loads like uh, air conditioners, water heaters, and refrigerators, controlling them in aggregate. So you're making sure that the, they're still providing um, the service that the customer needs, in, in this case, heating and cooling. Um, but you're changing when they switch on and off to be able to um, steer their power consumption in such a way that you can better match the output of renewables. And so here, this is what that would look like. If you don't control the loads, they consume power according to this blue line. Um, but you wanna track this balancing signal so it's like a tracking control problem where you want to track this balancing signal, which is in black, which might be the output of a, 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 a wind power plant or a solar power, power plant, or it's just the supply demand mismatch in the power system as a whole. And then you're using these resources to track that signal. Um, so we use tools from controls estimation and learning to do to solve these types of problems. Um, and like I mentioned, there's different sources of flexibility, thermostatically controlled loads, um, which are your air conditioners and water heaters. You can use industrial and commercial loads. You can use energy storage, uh, electric vehicles, so change charging schedules. You can also control the output of renewables, so basically curtail renewables at key times to provide flexibility to the system. But in terms of the water sector, people have been working for a while to understand the flexibility there. Um, and there's been some demonstration studies showing that agricultural pumping, so pumping water for agriculture, can be shifted in time. And you can use that to provide um, the grids and services and also wastewater treatment. So when you choose to treat um, wastewater and how much energy you put it into it at various times is something that is flexible too. Um, so the grid is trying to leverage all of these different sources of flexibility together um, to better help us balance renewables and deal with different types of issues that arise when renewables fluctuate and they're not very predictable. So water pumping as a source of flexibility, um, specifically thinking about drinking water pumping. So these drinking and wastewater networks consume only about 4% of the electricity used in the US, but it's still a significant enough fraction that we, we care that, that that's, that's um, if we could control that electricity consumption, that, that we'd have a large flexibility resource. Um, the majority of that 4% is for pumping. And there's, of course, some states that use much more energy for pumping, like California, um, than other states that have larger water resources. So what, what we've done is tried to say, well, if we think of the water distribution system as a battery, can we characterize its power capacity and energy capacity 
just to get a sense for how big that battery is. Is this a resource that is um, big enough to, for us to care about <laughs> in this space? So um, if we define the power capacity as the maximum power consumption of the supply pumps, so that's the amount of power that's controllable. And then the energy capacity is defined like this. It's basically tied to how much uh, tank storage capacity you have in the system. Um, and we've used a bunch of data um, that's publicly available from these two sources. Um, we end up with some interesting numbers. So Wisconsin has excellent data <laughs> that we were able to get a hold of. Um, and from the Wisconsin data, what we did was we extrapolated to the whole United States. And so the key numbers here to look at, um, the small, medium, large, et cetera, these are uh, different sizes of water, municipal water um, distribution systems and sort of how much power and energy capacity each of them has. And the total down here is the total, our estimate of the total power capacity and energy capacity of water distribution systems in the United States. And this is in terms of gigawatts and gigawatt hours. So these numbers are quite huge. And just to compare that, California's energy storage mandate is 1.325 gigawatts. And so the power capacity that we're seeing here is much higher than that mandate. But this is for California and this is for the whole US. Um, so it gives us some sense of scale. It's a large resource. It's not in, in, enormous, but it is a very large resource. And so it's sort of worth us trying to think about this. But this is again, ex extrapolating from Wisconsin because the data was available. Um, we're now looking at a data set from Arizona and Arizona uses much more energy for pumping water as you can imagine. And of course our numbers are, are getting more compelling down here when we use that to extrapolate to dry states versus wet states. So there's a lot of related work um, on understanding the coupling between water and power networks. Um, there's a, a recent study that looked at understanding the water distribution uh, for a specific water distribution system, how you characterize its flexibility. Um, and then there's other approaches that have looked at formulating optimal water and power flow problems. So it's how do you co-op how do you co-optimize both of these systems together? So for those of you who are familiar with, like, with uh, problems like the optimal power flow problem, this is adding the water network constraints. And the objective function can change to something like trying to minimize um, the energy costs associated with water pumping. So a variety of different work, including some, this one's out of MIT a few years back. Um, and then there's some other work that's looked at leveraging water network flexibility. So how do you specifically use flexibility in pumping and, and other resources that consume power in the water network to help the power grid. Um, none of these references here um, consider uncertainty though. So they assume water and power demand are, um, are known. And so the key difference with what we're doing is we're gonna treat these as uncertain because in reality, you don't know water and power demand. And so whatever strategy you use to leverage the uncertainty, sorry, to leverage the flexibility of the water network for the power network has to consider the fact that you have uncertain water and power demand. And here you're mentioning uh, relaxation and approximation. Is it because some hard physics of water flow? Yeah. Because we know that AC OPF is hard to model, right? Approximations mm -hmm. and relaxations exist. Is it the same for water systems? Yeah, exactly. So there's there's nonlinear constraints that you end up having if you want a tractable reformulation. Um, a lot of folks have proposed different approximations and relaxations to get to a computationally tractable form. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about where those where those nonlinearities come into. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so uncertainty in water and um, water and power networks. So water demand is uncertain at all the nodes in the water network, and power demand, of course, is uncertain. Um, and so here we're talking about net power demand, so load mi minus renewable um, injection. So the uncertainty could come from the load forecasts or from the renewables forecasts. Um, and so we've been working on this problem for a little while of how do you leverage water distribution network pumping flexibility to support power distribution networks, given these two uncertainties. So the paper I'm primarily going to talk about today is this, this one here, this third paper um, in proceedings of the IEEE, where we consider both water and power demand uncertainty and formulate optimization problems, stochastic optimization problems um, to schedule pumping, but also to respond to real-time um, forecast error realizations. So the goal is to utilize the water network's flexibility to support the power distribution network specifically to manage voltages. Um, the challenge is that the constraints from both networks are non-convex, and then we have uncertainty. So what we'll do is formulate a chance-constrained optimization problem. Um, and so that will be 
try to minimize the cost of pumping subject to the network constraints of both networks and uncertainty in the water and power demand. And what we want is two things. One is we want to be able to schedule the pumping in such a way that minimizes costs for the system, but we want to schedule it also to make sure that in real time, when we see realizations of the uncertainty, we can respond to that uncertainty realization and change the, the water pumping to make sure that there's enough water for the network and we're not going to violate voltage limits. So what we'll do is to find some affine control policies that will we'll take us, so we'll optimize over the parameters of those policies and we'll use the real-time um, uncertainty realizations to compute the adjustments to the pumps that need to happen to make sure we meet water demand and don't violate the voltages. So that's the framework. Um, so just jumping into the water distribution network formulation, the water distribution network is characterized by hydraulic heads um, and volumetric flow rates. It's sort of like voltages and currents in our power network. Um, you, we bound the hydraulic heads, the pump flow rates and the tank levels. Um, we can use convex approximations to characterize the pump um, head flow performance curve, which is nonlinear in general. Um, and we can use convex relaxations um, to compute a convex hull of the pump power consumption and pipe head loss. So in, in general, those are also nonlinear constraints. So including those into the full formulation makes these formulations not very tractable. So we end up using these approximations and relaxations which have been established in the literature. Um, and in terms of the power distribution network, um, we're going to assume we have radial power distribution networks, which is common in the US. Um, we have to bound the bus voltages. So the key constraint in the distribution power distribution network is that the voltages might get violated. Um, and that those equations also would be nonlinear, um, but we're going to use the linearized three phase unbalanced power flow model. So we're modeling th all three phases and the system can be unbalanced, but we're gonna use the linearization, which this, you know, there's a variety of different linearizations that work fairly well for modeling radial distribution systems. So we've uh, selected this particular one here, although we're not, um, it's not necessary that you use this particular formulation to obtain a tractable problem. The important part is that it's linearized. <clears throat> so this formulation neglects the last terms and assumes the voltage unbalance is small, um, but there are also extensions where you can include approximations of the loss. And, and, and it ends up being that most of the time for most of our cases, it's pretty close um, to the real solution. The problem with linearized powerful is more when you're modeling it in a, in a mesh transmission network. So. So um, in terms of how we handle water demand uncertainty, we treat water demand forecast error as a random variable. So at every node in the system, you have a forecast for the water demand, um, but the forecast error, how much, how wrong you are in your forecast is, on, is, in, is a random variable. And we develop uh, a control policy. So we're assuming there's gonna be an affine control policy. The pump will respond a certain amount based on the, the real-time forecast error. And we need to choose the, the parameters of that policy. So we're gonna compensate water demand forecast error realizations by adjusting the pumping in this way. So this is basically just saying that we need to adjust the pump flow rate um, equal to a parameter times the sum of all the forecast errors. So the pumps are compensating the total forecast error. And then this parameter we treat as a decision variable. So we're gonna optimize over it. So every pump is gonna have a certain amount that it will respond to the total forecaster to make sure that the water demand is met. So that's how a control policy like this works. So by specifying the form of the control policy, we're restricting ourselves um, to this affine form, um, which means that you know, there might be a better control policy that you could design, um, but it means that you can embed this into the problem and it's tractable and we still get to optimize over the parameter of how to distribute the water needs to the different pumps. And to handle power demand uncertainty, in this case, we treat the power demand forecast error at each bus and phase as the random variable. So we have to have a forecast of the power demand at every bus and every phase at that bus, all three phases A, B, C. So it actually requires quite a bit of um, forecasting and then data because in reality, in real time, you need the realization of that to see how far off you are from it. Um, and then we implement a corrective control policy that compensates the power demand forecast error um, realizations, but only the ones that cause voltage violations. So the idea here is that this is, if you look over here, the scale is voltage. Um, you want the voltage between be between a minimum and a maximum voltage. And in a power system, these are established already. 
So as long as you're sort of hovering in this area, you don't want any sort of control action. But as, if you go outside of the area, you want to pull the system back in. Um, and you can change the voltage, you can affect the voltage by changing power. So if you decrease, um, if you uh, decrease the power consumption, you'll, you'll pull the voltage back up. So that's the idea here. So um, you only want to apply this control policy when you need to, when you're out in this blue area here. So we have, this is the policy we write down, which is also affine, but it's C now is a, CE is a vector and rho is also a vector. Rho is the vector of all of the power demand forecast errors and C is a vector where you multiply a, a, an optimally chosen parameter by each element of rho. And then S is a binary that says you only respond if you're if you're outside of this white area and in these blue areas. So that's how this one works. Um, and then you can formulate a chance constraint optimization problem to say that we want to minimize the cost of scheduling of the scheduled water network operation, plus some kind of flexibility cost. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is later, but the idea being that um, these pumps are going to be responding in real time via this control policy. So you, there's some cost associated with them being responsive in real time. So we have to have a cost associated with that. Um, and then X, the decision variable is the schedule. Um, so we want to minimize pump power consumption. And we also want this um, flexibility chosen through um, the, the policy parameters. So we're choosing hydraulic heads, flow rates, real and reactive powers, um, pump powers, bus voltages, and we're choosing these control policy parameters. This is the full um, decision variable list down here. Um, so solving for the pump, uh, scheduled pump operation and the control policy parameter subject to water and power network constraints, and then a chance constraint that looks like this. So all the constraints with uncertainty included in them, so the row and the, the D are the forecast errors, um, they should hold uh, at a probability of greater than one minus epsilon, where epsilon is a design parameter that we choose to determine how confident we want to be about the constraints holding. So it's how much you're willing to let the system violate its constraints. Um, I'll pause there just for a second in case there's any questions. I, again, I don't have this ability to see if there are anything coming in. Nothing? Uh, I think we don't have it, uh, anything in the chat. So, but Great. again, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself, ask it directly or drop it to the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll keep moving along then. So the solution approach we use here is a scenario-based approach um, from Campi, Garati and Prandini. Um, and so the idea is that you want to make sure that you can solve the problem ro robustly for a set of scenarios. So you select a large number of scenarios, scenarios meaning realizations, um, of the error, in this case, from historical data, for instance. And you need to select a certain number of scenarios to make sure that you have probabilistic guarantees on your solution. And probabilistic guarantees means that your problem, um, that you've, you've solved the problem and that it's feasible for all of these, these sets of scenarios, but that it's specifically um, guaranteed for a constraint violation level, which you choose epsilon, and a confidence level, which you choose the psi here. So in this paper down here, they derive this relationship that says the number of scenarios you need has to be related to epsilon and psi like this, um, where delta is the number of decision variables. So that's um, the approach that we use. So the advantage is that we can jointly enforce the chance constraints. You, you can make sure that all the constraints are enforced jointly. All of the ones with uncertainty are going to hold at this together at a certain um, probability level. Um, and another advantage of this approach is that it uses data scenarios. So it doesn't require any knowledge of the uncertainty distributions in advance. Um, and so you're just taking in the data and not worrying about fitting them to an uncertainty distribution model. But the drawback is that it requires significant amounts of data. It's often very conservative in practice. Um, and then the probabilistic guarantees are uh, for this specific approach are only for convex problems. Um, and there's been ex some extensions to non-convex problems for scenario-based approaches. But um, in this case, what we're actually gonna do is convexify the problem. So the only non-convexity we had left because we already used convex relaxations and approximations for the network constraints, um, what we had left was this binary variable S. And if you remember, that's the one that said, we're only gonna apply the voltage control um, when we're outside of the voltage bounds. And so we had to, 
know if we're going to be if we need to apply it or if the voltage is fine. But what we'll do is remove that variable and always apply voltage control. So what this means is we're always sort of trying to drive the voltage in the right direction, even if it's already in the bounds, the between you know V min and V max, the voltage limits. We're still going to be applying um, a small change to the pumping uh, to move it. Um, in in sort of a better direction, even if it's not needed, but that makes the problem much easier to solve. Um, but it makes the control effort increase. Um, so this transforms the problem from a mixed integer um, convex problem to a quadratically constrained um, a convex quadratically constrained problem. Um, you don't need as many scenarios if you remove this because the, we're gonna use the standard version of the scenario approach instead of sort of the extended version that would allow for binary variables. Um, and then just to drive the point home about why this matters, uh, solving the original problem takes this long and solving the convex version takes this long. So obviously <laughs> this would be intractable. There's probably other better ways to do this, but this is the solution we use so far of just relax the constraint, remove the problematic variable, a binary variable. And then coming back to the flexibility costs. So there's some costs to the schedule. That's this part of the cost function. And then there's some costs to offering flexibility to the system. That's this part of the cost function. So this is um, the, the water providing flexibility based on um, water network, um, water demand forecast errors. And this is based on power demand forecast errors. Um, so how do we compute the cost of flexibility? Um, so in, in power systems, this is, a there's a hand we have a, I can we stop have right there. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. This was just something I was thinking about on your previous slide. So what kind of timescales are you looking at? So um, like the CP solves very, very quickly. So this is very much real time, but I guess we're not looking at the dynamics of the water system. The dynamics of the power systems are kind of taken care of, but in the water system, we might have things like um, the, the flow rate through the pumps and how quickly the pumps can act and the dynamics of the water there. Um, yeah. So what kind of time scale is the operation? Yeah, so the thought was to provide a schedule over the course of several hours that you do in advance. So in the case studies, uh, actually in these case studies, it's just a few time steps, but what, we, what we're doing now is looking at like a 12 hour ahead plan where every hour there's a schedule. And then in real time, you're responding to um, the forecast errors every few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so the MICP wouldn't be solvable at that scale. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So you're not explicitly modeling any of the dynamics of the power, uh, of, sorry, the water network. No, it's like both for power and water, we're looking at sort of quasi steady state flow, like mm -hmm. just the flow equations. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And fully realizing that there's other effects. I mean, I've given this talk somewhere where they were talking, asking me about things like water hammer and <laughs> yeah. it sounds like it, you're an expert on water networks. So we can talk more about that. But right now we're assuming that, that we're just, we're not considering the fast dynamics at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. John, we also have a question from the chat. Okay. So Regini Bansal asks you, how does the size of voltage band uh, affect uh, the constraints or a number of scenarios that you use for chance constraint approximation? And by voltage bands, he means this a distance between a minimum maximum bound where no control action is required. How does the size, yeah, I pulled up the, how does the size of the voltage band affect the constraints or the number of scenarios here? It doesn't affect the number of scenarios um, because it doesn't affect the number of decision variables in the problem. It, it's a parameter that you choose. Um, it will affect sort of how, um, It'll affect the feasible region of the problem and sort of how hard it is to solve the problem. Um, so if we reduce the band, it's harder to solve it, it just because the feasible region is restricted, but it won't affect the number of scenarios. And usually with the voltage band in particular, it's set by the power system operator and it's sort of fixed. Like pretty much everyone's using like 0.9 to 1.1 per unit for voltage. And it's not something that we usually play around with too much. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, he says, good. We also have one more raised hand from Greta. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask like, how do you choose the number of scenarios and epsilon parameter epsilon for the relaxation? So how do you choose the number of parameters in like here? Yeah, how, yeah, how do you choose like, yeah, these two like uh, design variable, like both. Yeah, and right. So. 
So um, it's a great question. It's a design variable, so it's sort of like up to you. <laughs> it depends on how, so you're saying with this chance constraint relaxation that you are okay with the constraints being violated occasionally. We're not, gonna, we're not doing a fully robust approach. And the reason why we often justify that in power networks is because there are, our model doesn't include all of the corrective control actions and different controllers that exist in the system to solve, to, to solve problems that might arise in real time if the system really gets into trouble. So you want this sort of normal operation to work without needing any of those extra controllers you're not including in your model. And you might want that to work at a 99% um, percent, uh, like uh, confidence, for instance, or a 95%. So often, often we're just choosing epsilon to be something kind of small. So the, the constraint holds at one minus epsilon. So you're choosing like 1% or um, five percent or something, and just assuming the rest of the time something else in the network is going to fix any real big problem that might arise. And then for this confidence level of psi, um, the problem isn't super sensitive to that because of the log term, and so people just generally choose that the uh, have a very high confidence, and then it doesn't affect the number of, of scenarios you need too much. The epsilon affects the number of scenarios you need a lot, so people play around with tuning that. But it's again, it's like it's heuristic. It's you know, you're just making an educated guess based on like your engineering knowledge of your system and how well it could cope if you start to violate constraints. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. So in this case, like I can see that the number of scenarios kind of greater or equal than this formula. And my mm -hmm. question is: Is you are are you using like equal to that or yeah. you somehow okay. equal to? So you would get okay. the probabilistic guarantee that it will hold at epsilon and psi if it's equal to or greater, but you're usually just sending it equal because you don't want to introduce more scenarios because it introduces mm -hmm. more uh, computational complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's like sure. good, good to go. It says there's one more, Should explain the shape of the non-convex function in the water network. Um, the cost curves are often best modeled as cubics, and so we'll often approximate them as quadratic or linear. Um, and then there's another relation that is um, where we take the convex hull, and I think I don't have a good sense for that shape. It's a, There's a bilinearity, basically, where you're multiplying the flow rate times the head. So what is that shape? I'm not sure. But that the issue is the bilinearity. <laughs> so I, I know that doesn't completely address the question, but at least it gives you some sense of the, the non-convexity. OK, I'll move to the flexibility costs. Um, so what I was saying is in, in power systems, we have a good way of assessing the cost of flexibility of our system because we have power system reserves. Um, so it's generators that hold back capacity to be able to respond in real time if there's an emergency in the system or just or we just need real-time supply um, demand. Um, we're, we're balancing real-time supply and demand mismatch. And so the price of reserves is sort of the, the price or the, the cost of reserves is sort of the cost associated with uh, a power plant being able to ramp up and down quickly. Um, here, we're asking the pumps to ramp up and down potentially quickly you know, and change their uh, consumption levels. Um, and so it's not quite clear how, to, how, how much that costs the pumps to do that. So instead of trying to say this is the way it should be done, what we've done is explore a variety of different ways to cost that flexibility. So in option one, we basically tie it back to our control policy parameters, because if a pump has a larger control policy parameter, it's going to respond more to uncertainty than another pump. But you could also tie the cost back to the maximum range that you expect them to adjust their flow rate or the maximum range that you expect them to adjust their power consumption. Um, and so we've explored all of these three and I, I still don't have a clear answer on which one's best, but it's sort of interesting to understand the trade-offs associated with each. Um, and this last one doesn't end up, does, ends up not working well, uh, mostly because of mathematically, if you, if you bring everything into, um, if you bring this cost into power instead of flow rate, it becomes messier to solve. Um, so to give you a, some sense of how this, how the res, uh, how the, the formulation works, I'm going to just show you results through a case study. So we're using the IEEE 13 bus system um, with this this power network over here, um, which is a, a common test network used um, in water networks. And we're randomly generating a bunch of forecast error for the water network and the power network at each of the nodes in the system. 
Um, and then for the power networks, it's all the nodes and all the phases. And then we're going to solve the problem and then evaluate the solution um, based on generating a bunch of new samples and then determining if with those new samples, the, 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 um, all of the constraints would be feasible. So we consider these three different cases and I'll, I'll tell you about them more later, but the, the main idea is we consider a case where we're gonna increase the demand in power quite a bit to push us up near our voltage limits versus one where we're a little bit away from those voltage limits. So this is what the results look like. Um, this is that case B and case C. So case B, there's a high, a constant high power demand. Case C has a decreasing power demand. The red lines are what you get if you just solve the deterministic problem. So it gives you some sense of what would be optimal if you weren't considering uncertainty. So this is in three periods, pump one's flow rate, pump two's flow rate, and the tank's output. So there's two pumps and a tank in the network. Um, and so you can see with the deterministic approach, you just kind of want, um, in this case, when the demand is constant, you just wanna be tracking that straight line. Um, but when you incorporate uncertainty, the, 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 the blue line is the schedule, the new schedule that changes. And here, you know, you're pushing the pump one's flow rate down. Here you're pushing pump two's up and the tank looks very similar. And then on, on the right, when you consider uncertainty, you get much more variation from period to period in the scheduled pumping. But beyond the schedule, what we do is compute um, these control policy parameters. And from the control policy parameters, you can determine how much flexibility each pump and each tank is providing to the system. So you should think of these blue bands as like the amount of flexibility. So we're gonna ask the pump to be at the blue line, the dark blue line, but then be able to increase and decrease its consumption up and down from that blue line within these blue bands. And the darker blue band is how much you're using the pump to respond to water uh, uh, forecast error, water demand forecast error. And the light blue is for the power demand forecast error. So you can see in the left case, so the case B, you can see that we're using the pumps quite a bit to provide support to the power network. And that's because the demand is high. And so we're actually close to our voltage limits and you have to use the pumps quite a bit to do that. Whereas in case C, there's a decreasing power demand, you're actually moving the system away from its voltage limits and you don't need to provide as much voltage support with the, with the pumps. And that's why this looks similar. The water control policy, the band for the water control policy, the darker blue one is pretty much the same left and right. But what, what's different is how much we're supporting the power network based on how much we have to be able to back off from the voltage limits. So this is what the results look like. Um, so here, the main thing is we're spatially shifting pumping from pump one to pump two, and we're providing significant uh, power um, flexibility to the power network. And on this side, we're doing more temporal shifting because demand is changing in the system. So we're changing when we're pumping and we're using the tank a lot more. So we're filling the tank and then emptying the tank. Um, and there's less flexibility that we need to provide to the power network because we're just not running up against the power network's voltage limits in this case as much, especially towards the end of the horizon. Um, and so to give you a sense of how this control policy works, uh, if there is, there would have been a voltage violation in our network, the control policy will shift the um, pump power consumption and push the voltage sort of back into the limit indirectly by changing power. And so what this is plotting is for each of the buses in the network, here's the voltage and there's multiple voltages at a bus because it's a three phase network. Um, and so there's gonna be three dots per bus at least, well, at maximum, some of them have less because they don't have all three phases present. Um, and here's a blow up of this part right here, which shows that the schedule, for the schedule, we would have gone below the voltage uh, limit, which is the red line. We wanna be above 0.95 and the schedule would have gone below, but with the pump adjustment, we go just above the line. So the worst case is right at it. So that's how the adjustments affect the voltage. Um, and then this slide is just to talk a little bit about those flexibility cost representations. So I mentioned option one, we were tying the cost to the control policy parameters. Option two, we're tying the cost to the full range of flow rate adjustments that the pumps can make. And you can see based on which one you choose, you get different results. These are the scheduled flow rates for pump one and two, which are different based on how you price flexibility. Um, and then looking over here, this is the empirical violation. So what percentage of the um, 
for, for what percentage of scenarios will we actually violate constraints? Um, and so you can see it's a little bit different, although both of them are very conservative. We're trying to be less than 5% and both of them are much less than that because this is 0.1% and 0.2%. So the solution is very conservative. So we satis in either case, we satisfy this, um, but we get different pump schedules and different costs. Um, and so it's still very much an open question of how do you treat flexibility costs for something like water pumping? Um, whereas in the power grid, we have flexibility costs for power plants, and we have a much better idea of how to treat that. Um, in terms of empirical violations, so this is we, when we evaluate the solution performance for the convexified and original constraints. So the idea being that our problem has probabilistic guarantees, but only for the convexified constraints. But really, we're trying to solve the original problem that has the full non-convex constraints. So we want to know how good is our solution to the convexified problem in the original problem. Um, and you can see down here in the convex, convexified problem, we're trying to make sure our constraints hold at a 95% um, probability level. So five is the violation level we allow. And we're way below that. So we're very conservative. But then when we apply the, the solution to the non-convex problem, we're way above it. So we're actually only satisfying it at like an 89% probability instead of a desired 95 in this case over here. And that's almost exclusively and perhaps exclusively because uh, we're violating the voltages. We're not often violating the any of the constraints in the water network. It's the voltage constraints in the power network. Um, and we're getting voltages that are just below our desired um, voltage limit, which is 0.95, but it's so close. It's just this little violation that's causing this probability of violations to be much, much higher than what we want it to be. But in practice, these tiny violations of the constraints actually aren't super important to the power network and wouldn't be a major problem. Um, you can see here, this gives you a visual representation of um, what the voltages are for the non-convex uh, power flow equations versus um, the convex ones using the linear approximation. And you can see there's like a slight difference between the voltages we compute with each set of equations. And in particular, the full equations would have predicted that the voltage would be lower. And that's where we're having problems because we're using basically this green line up here when we should be using this blue line. But using the blue one would introduce non-convex constraints and make it much harder to solve our problem. So there's different workarounds to do this. We could just heuristically adjust the minimum voltage level. And this more or less takes care of it, but it's heuristic. So it's for it's problem specific how much you'd have to do this adjustment. A key problem is that the chance constraints give us no insight into the magnitude or duration of the constraint violations. We just know if it's violated or not. We don't know how much or how long. And for power systems, how much and how long a constraint is violated is perhaps more important than if it's violated. So they're not necessarily the best tool to be using here. But we find in general that the con convexified water network model, which didn't see these sorts of mismatches between the convex and non-convex, um, that one we found is fairly reasonable for the system. We find that most of those convexifications didn't drastically affect the results and our solutions are feasible in the original problem, which was promising. Um, and then one thing to note here, there's a, a question. Uh, Daniel is asking, I was wondering what the standard conventional control scheme for these pumps and tanks are. Are they VFDs controlled to pressure set points or are they usually more of a bang bang control? There's variable speed pumps and there's fixed speed pumps and there's a mix of both in these systems as far as I know. Um, and they are scheduled. Usually they are taking into consideration like trying to pump more at night during, than during the day to, because prices might be different a night day that they experience um, or just to help the power grid in general, but they're sort of put on these fixed schedules and not adjusted in real time. That That's sort of what I understand about them. Is that, does that answer your question, Daniel? Okay. Yes, he says. Um, and so um, one thing I mentioned is the power control policy requires measurements of the the forecast error realization. So basically you have to know the, the power consumption at every node in every phase in your system in real time to be able to respond to it. Is this reasonable? Probably not. Like we're assuming we have a lot of information about our system so that we could be constantly responding and updating our response of these pumps to fix voltage problems. 
Um, so what we've tried to do is say, is there a simpler way to do this? Instead of having needing all the information from every node at every time, every node, every phase at every time, is there a way to sort of combine that information and respond to an aggregate of it? So for instance, we could compress like all of the forecast errors associated with all of these nodes into one bucket and all of these nodes into another bucket and then respond to those instead of responding to each one individually. And so we played around with this because we're really trying to understand how to make this practically implementable. Um, and what we find is that the, these sorts of simplifications decrease the solver time, they just decrease how much individual information we need from every node. They also increase cost and generally decrease the empirical violations. They make the problem more um, conservative uh, because you're not you're not playing with all the flexibility in the feasible space that you can. You're constricting it by doing this. So it's a trade off, um, but an important question of just trying to make all of this uh, work in real life. Um, I'm almost done here. This is my last technical slide, but I just wanted to mention um, what we're trying to do now is work on new formulations to decrease the computational burden of solving this problem. You saw in those test cases, I was just looking at three time periods. And the reason why we're looking at three time periods in these small toy networks um, is because this doesn't scale. <laughs> just to be frank about it, you need so many scenarios that even if you have a convex optimization problem, it's still huge and it's hard to solve. Um, so can we improve scalability um, so that we could actually apply this to real networks someday? So what we created for CDC, the CDC conference last year was an adjustable robust formulation. And we worked with um, Professor Lena Rold, who's at Wisconsin on this. Um, we applied the mon monotonicity properties of dissipative flow networks. Um, the tricky part was they don't apply directly. We had to make some assumptions and also restrict some of our control actions to ensure that the hydraulic heads and tank levels are monotonic functions of the reservoir water injections and controllable pump power consumption. So there was some pieces there to make sure that these like the setup was uh, monotonic before you could just apply these sorts of results. But what it did was it allows us to reformulate just the water network constraints um, as with their robust counterpart. But it's an affinely adjustable robust counterpart, meaning that you still are allowing um, uh, adjustments to real time forecast error through those constraints. So the water network becomes sort of we're solving a robust problem there. The power network we're still using chance constraints. It ends up being much faster to solve, but even more conservative than we already have. And it was already conservative to start with. So in the works right now, we're trying to make it less conservative, but still computationally tractable by assuming we have more information about uncertainty distribution so that we can analytically reform, for, reformulate some of the constraints like the power network constraints to see if we can get something that hits a better middle ground between computational complexity, performance, conservatism, et cetera. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, you know, we show in this work that you can use temporal and spatial shifting of water distribution network pumping to support the power network and help regulate voltage. Our existing solutions are pretty high cost. They're high reliability, which is good, but they're also high computational burden. So we're trying to develop techniques that achieve better trade-offs because we really like to apply this to realistic, larger scale systems. And we're also looking at trying to um, explore using water networks to provide multiple services. So we have a new paper that's gonna be in the Power System Computation Conference this year that looks at simultaneously providing voltage support to the distribution network and frequency control to the bulk transmission network with water pumps. So you're using any, any flexibility they have that's not used for voltage support to provide frequency control. So it's a nice way to sort of stack services and increase their value for the system. Um, and then as I alluded to sort of at the end there, how do we try to minimize information sharing that's needed between the water network operator and the power network operator because they don't, they're not going to be willing to share full information about their systems and they probably don't want to. Um, and how do you minimize the required measurements so that you don't need to put in a really expensive um, sensing and communication system throughout the system. So that's all I have. Um, I'll stop there. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. So we have roughly 10 minutes for your questions and answers, so please feel free to unmute yourself or drop your questions to the chat. Okay, we have a question from Kari. Hi, um, this is also part of uh, my student Jacob's question that he sent me through the chat. So <laughs> would there be any... Uh, <laughs> Would there be any potential for, I guess, generation at the storage nodes? 
So like, because you have the elevation difference, could you add some turbines and also turn them into distributed generation devices? When it went through, like, so instead of just using gravity to pull it through the network, just, well, use gravity, but also extract power. Yeah, just put a turbine in, in the, you know, like, like pumped hydro. Yeah, I mean, it sounds great. Um, I, I'm not a, a, enough of an expert in like the details of water networks to know if that makes sense for them. So I know from like giving this talk <laughs> that people are concerned about dynamics, like the question earlier, you know, water network dynamics and things like water hammer. They're worried about water quality because the water has to keep moving around the network and can't be stagnant for too long. So adding more water storage isn't isn't always the best <laughs> option. Um, and so trying to include some water quality um, constraints and metrics would be an interesting thing, but would obviously add a lot more complexity. And so what I would be wondering is like, if you did do that to add uh, energy extraction from the water moving, would it slow down the water? Would it cause other problems of the water interacting with materials you wouldn't want it to? I, that's the, the question I would ask. I, I don't know the answers to any of that though. Yeah, that's probably true. Plus, I don't know how uh, the elevation, I guess the head in those water tanks, if it's significant enough to make any sort of yeah, generation. Yeah, it would be efficient at all. Yeah, or it's not worth the cost. Yeah, I, yeah. A lot of, I mean, a lot of the networks that we play with don't even use elevated tanks. They're just using gravity fed systems, right? And the pumping is from groundwater aquifers to push it up just so that it can then flow downhill to customers. I mean, just trying to leverage water, uh, like water gradient, uh, you know, elevation as much as possible. All right, we also have a, a question from Daniel Shen. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, never mind. Uh, uh, this Rabat. mic doesn't work. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really great. Um, I love kind of seeing this multi-network kind of optimization, um, particularly with power system. Um, I think this question is a little less technical and more just kind of on the operational side. Um, yeah. The kind of the power that is needed for pumping, for example, in Hawaii on some of the islands is incredibly high. Um, mm -hmm. And that's for some of their largest loads for their power system. But mm -hmm. kind of doing this... Um, this internet work coupling is really difficult because of the kind of the ownership boundaries of the pump systems and the electrical grid um, and some right. of the other kind of hardware. So the lines, pipes and pumps and stuff. Right. So have, is that something you guys have thought of or is it kind of there's going to be like a collaboration with say the municipality or whoever owns the pumps and the power grid? It's an awesome question and I don't have all the answers. Uh, right now we've been mainly like, okay, how should we be solving this problem? if we had all the knowledge about both networks and now, but we always knowing that that's totally unrealistic. And so we're trying to collaborate with some folks who think more about like, what's the game that the water utility, like I say game, like game theory, that the water utility is gonna play with the power utility when they have asymmetric information and need to achieve a common objective. And how do they exchange kind of a minimum amount of information to achieve these outcomes, because both are, you know, critical critical infrastructures where you can't share full details with others without going through a lot of headache, right? Like if you've ever tried to get network data from any of these networks before, you know it's really hard. Sign NDAs and they still might not give it to you, <laughs> right? So I don't have good answers for what that would look like. I I think here it's if the power network wanted the water network to provide voltage support, they'd have some incentive to give at least these, like all they need is the forecast errors at the nodes. But the thing is the power network doesn't actually collect that information right now. So they would have to get that information to then be able to send it to the water network, but it's in their interest to give them that information so that then the pumps could respond the way they're supposed to, to the power network because they're benefiting the power network. So there's somehow some incentives that are kind of aligned, but there's still a total like mismatch in how this all would work and be coordinated. And I think that's like an issue with this whole field of infrastructure network coupling, not just these two networks, but any networks. Like we are used to drawing boundaries and having different types of engineers deal with these different problems and we haven't figured out how to coordinate them. Mm -hmm. so and then probably an unsatisfying answer, but like, I, I don't know is the answer. <laughs> no, absolutely. This is, this is exactly what I kind of, it's what I anticipated, but I was curious to see if there was more. Um, yeah. And presumably you'd also need something like pricing and some kind of compensation, whether it's a real-time price or some capacity price for the, the water network. Right. 
So we're assuming that the water network is responding to prices, um, which could be just retail prices that aren't even changing over time or space, or they could be responding to network prices that are actually coming from LMPs, mm -hmm. but um, that the voltage service would be compensated through a contract because there's no market for that right now. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, great, uh, I think we have a question from Daniel Shen, so in the chat. So Daniel says, were you able to find data on the magnitude of water demand forecaster versus electricity forecaster? ISOs can get quite good demand forecasts since they aggregate so many users, but I imagine that the water networks have larger area error because they're small <coughs> regions. Um, the issue is that in our case, so I don't have data on this specifically, especially at the distribution network levels. So we're making up our data. <laughs> um, but the issue is that we need demand forecasts at every node in a distribution system and at every phase. And so there's no, there's not aggregation then. It's like a five houses that might be connected to the same pull top transformer. Um, and then that's the node in the system. And so that's pretty hard to forecast accurately, right? So there's gonna be a lot of forecast error there. And then for water demand, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's, it's like, it's similar. Uh, you have several houses sort of connected up to a node and you're going to have issues with that too. So um, I don't have a sense of relative magnitudes there, unfortunately, but it's a good idea that we should get, we should get a handle on that. So there's right. another so, question. Yes, there is another question in the chat. Any thoughts on using distributed control algorithms to overcome the data sharing problem between power and water distribution systems? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the key. How do you have each of them control their pieces, but exchange enough information so that they both can converge? I, I think that's key here. Um, a lot of these types of chance constrained approaches of controlling multiple pieces, it's just trying to find the best approach you could get to target. Like you now know kind of how best you could do because you're solving an optimization problem ultimately that includes information about the whole system. We know in practice, we probably can't get to that best, but how close can you get to best with some other technique like distributed control? So it's a great idea. All right, I think uh, we ran out of questions. So we got uh, all the answers, great. Uh, thank you, Joanna, so much for joining. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. So. And uh, yeah, we will continue with our series. And for now, saying goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.